Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Um, so uh, a few words about our next uh, guests. Uh, in November 2021, it was revealed by Christie's that Beeple's physical and digital work, a two meter uh, tall LED uh, screen sculpture of an astronaut strolling through a dystopian landscape had been sold to a Swiss venture capitalist, Ryan Zura, for some $29 million, although that's an amount that actually um, has, uh, uh, has a different way of, 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 of measuring it um, uh, if you're a crypto native. Uh, it marked yet another landmark in the recent history of digital blockchain-oriented art. Uh, in this conversation, uh, Ryan charts his journey from crypto investment and entrepreneurship to building an art collection and why he's become such a vocal enthusiast for NFT art. Uh, Judith, uh, Judith uh, Benamou is a French journalist who created uh, Judith Benamou Reports five years ago, where she writes and makes videos of, uh, about art, artists and the art market. For 30 years, she's also been a columnist for the French economic newspaper Les Echos. Uh, will you give a very warm welcome to Ryan and Judith? Thank you very much. Merci. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Yes, super. So, Ryan, you teach me a word tonight, intrepid, <laughs> which in French means with no scare, <laughs> but in English means multiface. And you are multifaceted, I think, and that's what's interesting about your character. You are first a real person. Um, you, you manage a family office specialized in crypto wealth. But in the same time, you have, uh, you, have, um, you have a parallel life in the metaverse with this character. What's her, what's her name? Uh, this is a bag of oranges. Uh, and it's done by my good friend, uh, Mad Dog Jones. Um, but it's you. It, it, incidentally, this is my digital identity, and it corresponds to my digital identity's name, which is uh, Kukulabans. Kukulabans. Uh, uh, which comes from a, a joke from a, some friends of mine that I'm kooking around the metaverse and sort of just experimenting and, and sort of bouncing into things and, and trying new things all the time. And so it's sort of in this spirit of, of irreverent experimentation that, that the name uh, Kukulabans has come to be. So... Um... I happen to know you uh, last November when you bought the Beeple Human One, mm -hmm. which was a, a real statement. You bought it for almost $29 million. So first we are going to see what the kind of things that you collect and we will have a conversation about you. Does it work? We are trying. Kukulabans sure. want to stay here. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Each video is going to play all the way through. This will be very long. So, uh, but the music is cool. Actually. Uh, there we go. Ah, voilà. Ah, actually, this is an intro. So we'll walk through through some of the artists that that I adore. Um, th this is this is Maxim Zheshkov here. Um, uh, who is an amazing digital artist that, that creates these beautiful tapestries of using spheres in everything. And what's interesting here is that each one of these spheres is actually its own Mbutu kernel. This is a mind-bending amount of computation that goes into this. Um, uh, here is, is Rafik Anadal, which, which we spoke about before, by the way. This is not working too well, but we'll try. Um, uh, machine hallucinations, Mars landscape. Uh, ah. Yeah. Thanks, if we could. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this is Rafik's uh, MoMA piece. So this is a mashup of 130,000 uh, pictures from the MoMA. Um, put into this machine hallucination algorithm uh, that, that he uses. Uh, this was actually my first piece, which was just a commission piece uh, uh, from a, a Muslim artist based in, in um, 
Manchester, who has now actually become a curator uh, of mine that works for me, and it's a piece of my, my beautiful wife. Um, this is an amazing piece because th this, if we can get it to play. <laughs> Um, this is Brendan Dawes, and this sort of started uh, uh, a, a, a theory that we'll get into around what I call proof of artwork, and just the amount of time and artistic merit and effort and resources that go into a piece. This is done in conjunction with a, uh, a commissioned orchestra as well as, as an amazing choreograph, um, and it's called Pandora Variations because it, it, it goes through all of the, the emotions of the Pandora's box. Let's see if we can... Da, 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 which one? We'll come back to these. Oh, my. Ah. ah. This so, is a one. This is human one, obviously. Uh, and, and really... We still have the music of the former. We do. Maybe we could cut the music. That's okay. Thank you, guys. Um, and so, so this is Human One, uh, a deep meditation on mankind's first steps into the metaverse. Uh, and again, we'll we'll come back to this with the flow. Exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of cycle through these. But the video, it would be good for uh, uh, yes for our public to see the video because it's Although really striking. He invented video. a new a new form through this. Uh, it's somewhat. Um, stretched horizontally the video here. <laughs> but uh, yeah it actually does not look like okay a cube, we understand that okay. there are four screen and we have the feeling that there's a human being in a tank yep and he is walking through these ever-changing uh, uh, landscapes uh, and the really interesting thing about human one is that it will constantly update uh, over the course of of Michael Winkleman's career. And in fact, just this past week, uh, he updated the Explorer to be adorned in the colors of, of uh, the Ukrainian flag, walking through a war zone with a tattered Ukrainian flag in the background. Oh, wow. It reminds us that that human one will, uh, uh, will, will be a showcase of his changing political and social commentary over the entirety of his career. And the bet that I had made on Human One was a bet that as his career evolves, being able to, to capture all these pieces and catalog them over time will be something that I think is culturally important because it is my belief that he has the chance to be our generation's um, certainly most important American artist, uh, uh, certainly from a pop culture perspective. But that's for sure. When I saw the first time I saw the video, it was at Ansel Richobrist uh, Instagram. Um, Ansel Richobrist is, uh, is the artistic director of uh, Serpentine Gallery, and Schumann did a book and an exhibition with him. That I happen to know you. And it's striking, it's striking to see that uh, people here really inv invented a new form because it's, it's physical and digital. Mm -hmm. One say physical for classic art um, and also the constant evolution of it. So that's a real revolution. And you told me when I interviewed you, you told me that you were ready to put even more money we were, yeah. We were prepared. I was prepared to go uh, go higher for for the piece, um, and it, it's because I, you know, this millimeter of real estate that exists between the our physical realm and the digital realm, I think, will become increasingly culturally important, um, as well as as increasingly valuable. This this sort of bridge between the metaverse and uh, the real world, and. Again, that is exactly what, what Human One is, is it invokes this uh, conversation with oneself about their own relationship between their digital identity and their, their physical identity. Um, it is a, the first native to the metaverse, and you know, that causes you to have this conversation with yourself about 
what you are. You know, we're native to the physical world, but we can also have a, uh, an identity and a personality and, and exist in this digital realm in parallel. And for many people, that is becoming increasingly important. And there's a word, a new word, which is digital. Yes. For this kind of art. And probably everyone really involved in NFT says that that's a ne really next very important step. And be people did it in a very talented way, right? Yeah. I think what, one of the things that I've, I've enjoyed about some of the artists that, uh, that I've shown here, whether it's Maxim Zheshkov or, or Beeple or, uh, or, or Mad Dog Jones, is offering a really compelling physical to c accompany the digital. Uh, uh, and yes, it's digital art, but then when there is this physical interaction, we see that it, 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 it invokes a new emotion and causes a new cohort of people to become interested in it. Uh, I, there are a lot of traditional uh, art collectors who, who were not willing to accept NFTs and digital art as legitimate art. But once they were mesmerized by, by Human One, that, that changed and that bridge. Exactly, like me, I mean, I'm not a collector, but I'm a commentator. And uh, the, the, the record price for people, I think it was important because it was the first one, but it was not as, which was $69 million, but it was not as innovative as this one. And the future of people is, is now is something which doesn't look like a joke because it did human one. I interviewed people too, and he told me that he didn't know anything about art. And he was very proud to show me that he bought a, a, a Louvre catalog of the collection. Look what I bought! <laughs> <laughs> and he, wa he has never been to a gallery before. He didn't know anything about the art system before. It's interesting. I, want to, I would like us to speak about this idea of metaverse, which mm -hmm. is also um, a very new idea f for a lot of people, this parallel world that, mm -hmm. in fact, we are no now everyone is very involved in. And it, we can consider it as a poetic world, mm -hmm. or our mind, or our dreams too, which are taking a new form from the computer and our telephone. Mm -hmm. What could you say about the metaverse? Well, I think one of the most important things about the metaverse is that it is a plural term. It is not a singular term, yeah. right? So it will not be one, and it certainly will not be uh, one created by Facebook. Uh, the metaverse will be many different iterations of these fantastical realities that we can create in digital spaces. Um, you know, to the point that, that we were discussing the, the other night at dinner, uh, it is a, an extension of our mind the same way that that, that poetry or, or fantasy novels have been an extension of our mind, which is now we have different digital tools to create these, these new realities that we can then participate in and be part of the unfolding story, which is, I think, very, very compelling. You know, to, to the extent that, that people are confined in any way, whether it's through the, you know, what has happened with a pandemic or, or, or whether they you know, can't go outside for, for something, this gives a, a new world that they can explore. And, and I think that's why it's resonating so much with so many people of very different walks of life. Mm. And this isn't, this isn't isolated to say, you know, putting on VR glasses and trying to immerse yourself in a digital experience. In fact, I think that, that we'll look back on that as a very rudimentary early version of, of metaverse, again, in the plural sense. That, that these are digital realms that we will create together. And, and this idea of being able to not only be a consumer of it, but be a creator of it is part and parcel to what, what the metaverse will evolve into. We, we were speaking about that last uh, few nights ago. I interviewed recently um, Anselm Kiefer, which is a in a way a traditional artist, a painter. And at the end of our, as the interview of our discussion, he said, the only reality is poetry. I was stuck. Uh, uh, 
what, I, what is he saying? And it, I think it's exactly the same story as metaverse. Poetry, if you want poetry, if poetry is always in your mind, if you want poetry to be true, that's the most important. Like if your dream when you wake up are important, it's exactly the same thing as metaverse. I, I would like to understand why you needed to have a, um, a, a digital twin. Why? Uh, so it's not necessarily a digital twin, because if we go back to her, yeah. she looks nothing like me. Yeah, exactly, uh, but it's a twin, but of your hidden identity in a way, uh, or the identity you would love to exa be. Exactly that. You so, want to be so, a sexy girl. Yeah, so, so you get to choose, and um, I think one of the reasons why the concept of the metaverse resonates so, so deeply with so many people is that you get to choose who you are and what you are. Uh, and so, so for me, you know, I can sometimes come across as a like older, white, gruff man. <laughs> and that, <laughs> Not and that, so rough. Right, and so, so uh, you know, in, in this digital realm, to be, to explore the possibility of being what, uh, something completely different than, than what you are is, 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 I think, interesting and unique. Um, and then on top of that, I, you know, there's a, there's a popularity among what are called 10K profile picture projects these days, that people buy into this community and there is an inclusiveness in that community that now I'm, you know, now I'm an ape or now I'm a punk. And for me, I didn't want to, to go in that way. I, and so I chose a one of one piece of art rather than, than uh, some kind of like community in exclusive, exclusive or inclusiveness. I wanted something that was unique and one of one. Uh, and then the artist itself, Mad Dog Jones, I think will, will, will likely be remembered as, as arguably the greatest Canadian artist, certainly living Canadian artist, and also one of the, the best digital artists on the, on the planet. He creates these, these spaces that are, uh, it, it's almost like a future or, pres or sort of present future that could have been but wasn't. It's somewhat surreal, but, but completely within the realm of possibility, uh, and that's, and that's sort of the, the vibe that I was going for. But you told me something very interesting about the idea of choosing a, f a, a female character. Mm -hmm. Why? Why did? Oh, so did the, actually, that brings and, and this is why you're such a wonderful journalist. You remember more details than, than I do about <laughs> my decisions. Uh, so that brings me to a third point, which is uh, it is you know I spend most of my time thinking about the future because that's where I will spend most of my time. And I observe that uh, in the not too distant future, the generation that is coming up now that will be generation A, so that's the generation that comes up post uh, generation Z, will, you know, it would be called generation alpha, but I call it generation alpha mare because I think it will be the golden age of the feminine, that you can see it in the media and in the reference points of our, of our younger daughters uh, that they will, they will grow in an age where their confidence is embraced and they're able to do more and be more than, uh, than previous generations. Uh, and, and I think the world will be much better for that. And that's why you want to be one of these characters yes. who has more potential, right? Yes, and so that's... that's so because we think like you would like to be a woman for as a reason, but that's very interesting. It's very linked to the society and the potential of... Women. Yes, it, the, generally that I, I, I want to sort of embrace this feminine movement because I do think that this will be the golden age of the feminine. Lucky us, <laughs> waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, before, let's speak about the story of, an, uh, of NFT, the first sure. NFT. You are very involved in the story, I mean, you are very interested in collecting the first NFT. Could you tell us about that? Oh, uh, well, the Kevin McCoy. Uh, are you, you're talking about the Kevin yeah, McCoy yeah, yeah, yeah. NFT? It's 2014? That's, that's an interesting one. Uh, so, so Kevin McCoy created what we understand to be the first NFT. Uh, and uh, 
and I have been pursuing it. I was the underbidder in, in the auction. Uh, and N last? I, it was last summer. Um, at uh, Sotheby's? At, at Sotheby's. And in fact, that was the auction where, where I bought uh, Pandora Variations. Uh, and I'm very happy with Pandora Variations because it, uh, it started this concept for me of, oh no, of proof of artwork. Of what? Uh, of what I call proof of artwork. And so proof of artwork is this concept uh, taken from proof of work of, of cryptocurrencies. So the baseline cost or baseline value of a cryptocurrency is the sum of all of the ex capital expenditure and operation expenditure that has gone into securing the ledger to that point. So all of the sort of money that has been spent, a cryptocurrency is not going to be worth less than what everybody has sort of put into it. And this concept of proof of artwork, I, I take from it where a, a piece of digital art is, is worth at least all of the artistic merit and time and uh, collaboration and uh, you know and resources and computation like I mentioned about about uh, Maxim Zheshkov's work that goes into it and this you know I had lost the Kevin McCoy in that in that moment which we'll come back to in a second but I had won this piece uh, instead that day and that actually set me on on a great path because that idea of of looking at these pieces from the perspective of how how much resource intensity has gone into it, into creating this beauty or this art, uh, has been sort of my guiding north star as I navigate this space. Ah, because I wanted to ask a question about the criteria of selection of your work in this NFT jungle. Yeah, so, so, so that's really the, the, the guiding principle, is proof of artwork. That I'll look at something and I'll ask myself, you know, th this idea, uh, is it rare? Um, is it important? Is it you? It, you know, is it unique? unique? Is it technically sophisticated in some way? Is there some level of training and artistic merit and time and collaboration and computational resources that have gone into this? And so something like a Brendan Dawes, where you know he brought in a full orchestra, brought in choreographers, brought in. Uh, you know, spent an incredible amount of time into this, the amount that I had bought it for versus what he had spent on it, it gave me confidence in an unknown area. By the way, this is going entirely too fast, but that's fine. It gave me confidence in a completely unknown space that, uh, you know, that it wasn't worth less than, than sort of this baseline proof of artwork. Um, and, and so... Yeah. And you, sorry, you wanted to go back to... Uh, so, the, so, so the Kevin McCoy... 2014 is the first NFT. That is the first NFT uh, that, that we know but of. But super pioneer, right? Um, you know, it's not the first digital artwork, and I think it's just an extension of digital artwork. And it's just the connection of two very important points. The rarity that we can have with a one-of-one one artwork, and then the importance of, uh, of, of what you know, crypto assets represent, which is digital scarcity. All crypto assets from Bitcoin until now are just a form of, of actually proving digital scarcity. Satoshi Nakamoto solved the complex computer science problem, which is called the Byzantine generals problem. And long story short, that established digital scarcity. Before that, if you made a digital currency or a digital piece of art, anybody could copy it and then they could represent it as the original and then you would have hyperinflation and it would immediately devalue to near zero. But by solving this, this computer science problem, we were able to establish digital scarcity. And when we started in crypto, you know, I've been in, I've been in the game for, for a decade now, it, we, we used to talk about these, these use cases where where uh, you know I industries that had historically been uh, coerced by intermediaries would be disintermediated, and that the creators would become the the value captures. And in in a decade in crypto, I can tell you nobody 
predicted that art would be the thing that brought us, that would bring us into the mainstream. But mm. here we are, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, you know, this, this idea that we're able to use these crypto technologies for artists to disintermediate themselves and, and be able to capture both financial freedom and artistic freedom, I thought was a really inspiring story. Um, and um, so you appreciate very much Mad Dog Jones, and he, create, sure. and he created this uh, crush and burn art. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about it? Because it's innovative, and it's even before Damien Nurs, who did his NFT, it's, he's using the same idea of destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's good to reestablish the truth. For sure. And so, so Mad Dog Jones, who, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, created the replicator. And the replicator is an aesthetic somewhat similar to, to a bag of oranges. All of, his, all of his aesthetic sort of, you know, almost looks like a stained glass, which, which comes from his father. Um, who was a stained glass yes. master. And, and, and the replicator in this sort of somewhat futuristic vibe is a piece where you can burn the piece and get something new. And it probabilistically changes as you go up from replicator one through replicator six, such that the new thing could be something completely, you know, completely worthless, or could be something even more valuable and even more beautiful than the previous replicator. And so he was really the first to experiment in, in, in this way. Uh, and uh, you know we call this and other experiments that that he's run uh, the Mad Dog Jones experiment, and this idea of playing around with you know with interaction with your collector and having the collector be part of the creation process because the collector needs to make a decision: Will I take the risk to you know to burn this and create something new, or will I just be happy with with what this is? and seeing a community sort of reason through what is better and, and what, you know, how value may be accrued over time. Because if everybody burns, then in fact, the burned piece, which was supposed to be the more valuable, may become the less valuable because the, the rare thing is the original one, right? But if, every, if no one takes the, the leap of faith to burn, then the few people who do end up sort of getting a, a grand prize, but all of this is probabilistic. Uh, and that level of experimentation is some, and playing around with this digital scarcity is something that I think is, is very interesting and, and we're, we're just at the cusp, the, just at the knee of the curve of an incredible generation of uh, innovation by digital artists. So we, we need very soon to finish, but I just wanted one minute to speak about cryptocurrency linked to NFT art. Sure. So what do you, what's the connection and what, do, you, do you think it's an LC relation? Um, so, I mean, they're both, they're both forms of digital scarcity. And I am, I am very encouraged that we've seen this uh, massive transfer of wealth from, from people who are just in crypto early uh, and, and had accumulated a certain amount to digital artists who are creating. Mm -hmm. so, so to that extent, I think it's, 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 very, um, uh, it's very healthy. Uh, there, you know, there is this sort of shock at some of the price points that people pay for NFTs. And the way that I would explain this is actually it's a variant of Metcalfe's Law. Uh, Metcalfe's Law, just very, very quickly, is is the law that this, the value of a network is the, the square of the nodes and connections in that network. So a network of three is worth nine times as much as a network of one, not three times as much. And, and the interesting thing about NFTs is, you know, if I had a, a Picasso on my wall, the number of people who would walk into my house and have the financial resources to buy it and the inclination to make me an, a compelling offer is very, very low. So it just sits on my wall. But with an NFT, whether it's this one or, or, or a Max Jeshkov, anybody at any time 
globally can bid on this. And because you have a very large, well-capitalized group of people, uh, at any time, you know, they can, they can make a bid on any piece. And so you have greater velocity, and that's what raises the price of these pieces. And so it could seem somewhat unhealthy from a price perspective, but within crypto, we don't, we don't necessarily see it that way. We actually see it as just the, uh, the value increase of having the accessibility of being able to offer anything at, at any time to anybody. But luckily, there are Picasso in museum, and we can share the pleasure of seeing them in real. Don't forget that a Picasso in real is never like a Picasso in a screen. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> OK, I think well, we need to, oui, please. Uh, I would just like to thank you for, for everything you do, for, for the important contribution that you make to Art Canon. Uh, the work that you do is, is, is incredibly uh, important to us all. And the innovation that you bring by inviting uh, NFTs and digital artists into your important narrative uh, is, uh, uh, we're very grateful for, uh, for, your, for, for this invitation and this you, contribution. You took my privilege of thanking you. <laughs> I would like to thank you a lot for being, being so friend, frank and open-minded about this new this new really jungle of NFT, and uh, it's just the beginning of the story, and I think it's fantastic. Merci beaucoup. Maybe, um, maybe before we, we thank you, there would be, I mean, <laughs> we have run out of time, but I do want to give the audience the opportunity to ask, ask a few questions because you've brought up so many things. So, gentlemen here, and then Victoria. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, that was very insightful. Um, how do you, from a collector's point of view, how do you protect your collection? So um, uh, I, I take a, a, what we call it an OG ethos in the space where I am self-custody of everything. Um, yeah, I, so, it, so it's, all, it's all on like cold, air-gapped, Shamir secret sharing, um, uh, and, you know, and in deep vaults in this way. And, and so, you know, one of the things that I encourage people to do is explore this, this concept of self-custody. It's a, it's a deep um, sense of, of personal sort of sovereignty, but also responsibility, because there's no helpline to call, right? Like if my, you yeah. know, if, if we my, heard about yeah, several yeah. catastrophe, no? Yeah. Uh, but but I, I prefer the, I pr prefer the, the, you know, the kind of the true ethos of the space, and so self-sovereignty is important to me. Um, first, thank you so much. This was an incredible talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, being one of the first in this environment 10 years ago, how do you see regulations going? And are you part of that thinking? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, how do you see the future um, for our children in their mind, living in both worlds, both their dream on the metaverses and in the real life? Um, so, w w with with respect to to uh, regulation, uh, I think we're starting to see that uh, regulators around the world understand that that these technologies are really really important, and that they're taking a thoughtful approach. And you know, I self-selected to be in Switzerland because. The Swiss were, were the first to, to really take a thoughtful approach to this, and they benefited greatly from it. And I think you're seeing places like Dubai and even America open their eyes to the fact that if they uh, if they take a, a uh, you know a hatchet to where a scalpel is needed, uh, they will they will only harm themselves. Um, and so I'm encouraged with with the recent steps of of how regulation is unfolding. I think there's a lot of interesting. Uh, uh, concepts that you'll see with with digital art and and with NFTs. So, for example, like we take these pieces. So, I'll will take a piece that has very obvious value, like a a Maxim Zhezhkov, and we will yield on top of those uh, pieces. And so, how that you know how that is regulated over time, I think, still needs to be to to be decided. But we look at these as as capital assets, right? And so, um, so. 
you know, it, it, then the question becomes is, are they a security? And that is a whole other, a whole other sort, of, uh, 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 sort of ball of wax to, to unfold. The question with respect to, to um, how I look at this for, for, for our children, uh, there, there are two things that come to mind. One, the future is far more sci-fi than we think. That, you know, the reality that Generation Alpha Mare will, will in front is not something that I can probably even imagine right now, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, and then I do think that the world is tending to get much better. That, you know, we can have nostalgia, uh, but I am really not, as a historian, I don't have great nostalgia for the past. I have nostalgia for the future. And so I think generally, even though I can't imagine what the, the what Generation Alpha Mare will confront, I do have confidence that they will confront a far more inspiring future than we live to, through today. Um, I'm just going to piggyback on that question about the future. Um, anyone who's been in the crypto space will realize that time moves at a, at a pro-accelerated we, we pace. We work in dog years. Right? Yeah. 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 And um, whereas in traditional um, financial markets, the notion of volatility is something to fear uh -huh. and steer clear of. Volatility is actually the alpha in uh, in the crypto market, right? Mm -hmm. And and so um, you know a two percent move in the Nasdaq is considered um, a, a cause for concern. Two percent in crypto is nothing, no. Like it's it's not even uh, you wouldn't even it wouldn't blink even at register, it, right? You wouldn't yeah. even register yeah. it, right? But but that notion of um, I mean, the one way I've described uh, crypto to other people is like accelerationism accelerated. Uh -huh. It has this exponential quality to it. And, um, and, and that in relation to the future is interesting because let's, let's be honest, I mean, Bitcoin is 12 years old roughly, right? Yep. Uh, Ethereum, seven years old roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, and every day we have new projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, the vast majority of the 12,000 coins that are on CoinGecko today you know, will arguably not be around, not only in the next cycle, but maybe even the next year or God mm -hmm. knows, no? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to NFTs, I mean, Judith sort of, uh, I think, made quite a personal uh, declaration about the fact that a Picasso sits in a museum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could, we could sort of d dissect what that means. But, but what I take from that is that the, the art and culture that has mattered historically matters because it transcends our immediate present moment, right? Mm -hmm. So the things that will outlive us, mm -hmm. that will tell stories to, our, to future generations about our, us and everyone before us, you know, the way in which mm -hmm. the past is in the future, the future is in the past, etc. I think one of the questions that I, I get asked a lot now is, you know, will these things last? No? And if they are, to some extent, um, I mean, NFTs are, to some extent, um, financialized tokens. No? They're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, Suzu of uh, Three Arrows recently said that he believes that a lot of the kind of uh, newbie um, uh, retail energy that would co go into you know, what we would call meme coins or shit coins mm -hmm. a year or a few years ago has basically gone into NFTs now, right? And that's why you have 12-year-olds out trading, you know, any Gen Xer like me. I mean, I feel like a complete boomer in relation to this space. I'm constantly reminded how old right? I am. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, but, but, but there is, of course, this whole notion of, of, the, of, the, of flipping NFTs, no? right? Because, mm -hmm. because they are essentially uh, financialized tokens. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, um, uh, Dorian is gonna give a talk on Saturday about the kind of glossary inherent, you know, this kind of obfuscating glossary in crypto, but the pump and dump is a uh, manifestation of this extreme kind of acceleration. How many of these NFTs are we still going to be looking at talking about in 10 years time, 20 yep. years time, 100 years time? Will there, will, I mean, I know, I understand why we would want to say Beeple is the Picasso of our times. Mm -hmm. There's no way of knowing that, of course, until we can time travel backwards. But could you say something about yeah. that hyper-acceleration that seems such an endemic part of crypto 
and this the opposite, which would be a longevity, yeah. you know, and, and and the idea that culture, really meaningful culture, is something that transcends our present moment. Yeah, I mean, I it, it, it's important to remember that we build on the shoulders of giants, right? So so crypto is accelerated because it's being built on the internet, it, you know, and and so it should move faster than than the internet, and that. Um, there is a tendency in the world to, to, to focus on the 90, you know, 95, maybe even 98 percent that will die off. Uh, and, and actually, I just look at that as the natural ebb and flow of, of these cycles. And that's why, you know, I try to focus, it, it, even though I did not collect museum art prior to this, I try to focus on this, this sort of rare upper crust of uh, of NFTs because I think that those will have longevity. You know, I I, I think long after the vast majority of, of 10K PFP projects have died off, uh, Human One will still sit in a museum uh, and be and capture the minds of, of, of onlookers. And so that's why we try to to focus on on that upper crust and you know and use something that that we can look to and, and say it was very technically sophisticated for this period of time, say like Max, which again uses just like a mind-bending amount of computation that, that, that goes into some of these pieces. Um, the, but if you look at contemporary art today and the, produc the production of young artists, which are sold um, just ex existing, I mean, in terms of carry of five years and selling at auction for, for half a million dollars, there are plenty of them, and one can be absolutely sure they will not exist even in 10 years. So it's probably this kind of phenomenon, but with different publics, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, we, I, I think it, in crypto, we're, we're trained to, to embrace the chaos and, and accept that you know, much of this will fail, but the important evolution of the technology that, that survives will uh, will we'll drive us forward, and that's what matters in the end. But to embrace the chaos is a very big uh, statement, no? <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> Let's embrace the chaos before we go. <laughs> well, I mean, either the chaos happens to you, or you, or yeah. you somehow, you know, benefit from the chaos, no? Or, or at least don't find yourself on a kind of destructive end of it. We have time for one more. Do you have, do you have a question? Last question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, is related to identity and uh, appropriation of ethnic, uh, you know, identities and PFPs in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's two ways you can look at it. Like some people embrace this sort of fluidity where, you know, you can you can uh, be any kind of ethnicity on the metaverse, and mm -hmm. you can have an uh, you know any kind of ethnicity as a PFP. Mm -hmm. And some people think that you're actually helping out the artists, you know, from like uh, minority backgrounds, if you use a PFP that is like black or, you know, or, or darker tone skin. You see that uh, in the Crypto Covens, for example, you know, which is a very hyped PFP project, then a lot of people started to, to wear Covens that were different skin color. And then you had this backlash, this backlash where people started to feel weirded out by that, where there was a lot of like male white guys having these PFPs of black women. And there was a lot of talk about this. So there's no consensus. I don't think there is a consensus. Uh, I personally feel <coughs> a little bit weirded out uh, when I see a lot of like white guys as black women on the metaverse. So I would like to know how you feel about that. Uh, do, you, do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I think that we're very early and that um, bringing too many rules of like polite, society into this too early can can disrupt things. So like it, the prob the flip side to what you're saying is actually the problem that we had with CryptoPunks where uh, African or like black CryptoPunks were trading at a substantial discount to white CryptoPunks. 
And so I, I looked at the, the, the crypto coven thing as actually really inspiring because, you know, it, like unfortunately, the, the vast majority of crypto is still, is still white male. But in that one uh, project that you mentioned, crypto covens, white men stepped up and prioritized that. And in fact, that came largely from, uh, from inspiring leadership from Serena Williams' husband, uh, Alexis Ohanian. Uh, and so I looked at that as like uh, giving value and deference to, to, to like, you know, uh, to black aesthetic. And I thought that that was, that was generally positive. Um, and I don't, I guess we may have different feeds, but I didn't really see that much of a backlash. I thought it was actually a really positive in the end. And I myself embrace using other cultures uh, not as like cultural appropriation, but as cultural celebration. Um, and, I, and I think that, that generally we should be open-minded to that. Thank you. Uh, we have run out of time. I'm going to have to wrap this up. Um, so before, before uh, I thank Judith and, 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 and Ryan, um, I want to w uh, welcome you all to day two of the Global Art Forum, which will uh, be on Saturday at 2.30 p.m. here. We have an amazing uh, program with Holly Herndon, Matt Dryhurst, Laura, um, Kevin Buist on Ecto Games. Uh, we have a number of the uh, exhibitors from uh, Art Dubai Digital and Dorian Batka on, uh, on, a, on what will be a very amusing introduction to uh, the, uh, the, the jargon, the terminology, uh, some of which you've just heard. Um, and then we continue on Sunday uh, again at the same time with another interesting program. Program. Sorry? I am, I'm oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be, you've got, obviously got to come. Um, so yes, please do come. Please tell people to come. Uh, everyone you know. Um, uh, uh, free alpha, that's what we're offering here. Um, uh, will you give me uh, uh, a, a, a huge round of applause and, and thanks to Jude, both Judith and Ryan. Thank you so much for an amazing Thank talk. you.